Good day to you, fellow day nights and other passers-by, and welcome to this video, indeed my very first YouTube video, so I dare hope you will excuse the quality of the image, the sound, the setting, as well as the editing. My name down here is Lingua Pixie, and today I would like to talk to you about the voices of women in the literature at the turn of the 19th century, and more specifically in The Mysteries of Adolfo by Anne Radcliffe, and Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. So, without further ado, let's dive into this. Well, just a little bit of ado though, um, to tell you that I researched all the stuff in this video in 2008 for the dissertation for my master's degree in um, English studies and I never really had the opportunity to share this piece of research beyond my defense committee and my classmates, so I hope you'll enjoy it. So before I talk about literature, I'd like to give you a little bit of context first. A very common stereotype about women and language is that women talk a lot and about nothing important with that. Well, guess what? People already thought that in the 18th and the 19th century. According to Stephen H. Brown, who studied misogynistic satires in the press, our times representations may even have been forged specifically in that particular time. He says, Insofar as such images of women's speech were promoted in popular and pejorative terms, we may accord to the 18th century male satirists a significant role in shaping modern attitudes about women and speech. Also, the whole the youth is ruining everything, including our perfect language thing, is old news, for it was already raging in newspapers and mundane conversations in Jane Austen's time, Except it was not just the youth that did the ruining back then, oh no, it was the women. For instance, in the issue of the world dated from the 12th of December 1754, Mr. Richard Cambridge wrote, I must beg leave to doubt the propriety of joining to the fixed and permanent standard of language a vocabulary of words which perish and are forgot within the compass of a year that we are obliged to the ladies for most of those ornaments to our language I readily acknowledge. A week earlier, Lord Chesterfield had voiced similar complaints in the same newspaper. Not content with enriching our language with words absolutely new, my fair country women have gone still further and improved it by the application and extension of old ones to various and very different significations. He takes the example of vast and vastly, saying that they can mean anything and are the fashionable words of the most fashionable people. Long objects are vastly great, small ones are vastly little. Women were also judged for their lack of general knowledge of grammar and their clumsy writing style, which is rather ironic given that were women granted the same level of education as men, which the proto-feminists of the time demanded, that problem would have been easily solved. So, women ignored basic grammar and invented words, it seems, and Jane Austen actually talks about it in Northanger Abbey. First, Isabella Thorpe's speech seems to be in perfect accordance to the depiction of women's speech in the papers. Laura G. Mooneyham remarks that her favourite modifier is amazingly, and she uses a lot of superlatives such as the sweetest cloak or the most conceited creature in the world, as well as other forms of exaggeration and a lot of adjectives that convey emotion or intensity, such as delightful, horrid, charming, heavenly, vile or frightful. However, Austin kind of breaks the stereotype, or rather changes the guilty party from women to vain people, by having Isabella Thorpe's brother, John Thorpe, use new words as well, such as famous in the meaning of excellent or tipapi, for and steady. Under Isabella's influence, Catherine starts to use that kind of vocabulary as well, and she gets scolded by Mr. Tilney for it. I am very much surprised. Isabella promised so faithfully to write directly, Catherine says, to which Henry replies, promised so faithfully, a faithful promise. That puzzles me. I have heard of a faithful performance, but a faithful promise, the fidelity of promising. 
What is probably the most memorable example of a conversation about new words and meanings in North Arabi is the debate between Mr. Tilney and his sister Eleanor about the word nice. Okay, so English is not my mother tongue, hello, and I must confess I still don't completely understand what the word nice was supposed to mean back then, so I'll just let you be the judge of it. But now, really, do not you think you doll for the nicest book in the world? The nicest, by which I suppose you mean the neatest, that must depend upon the binding. Henry, said Miss Tilney, you are very impertinent. Miss Morland, he is treating you exactly as he does his sister. He is forever finding fault with me, for some incorrectness of language, and now he is taking the same liberty with you. The word nicest, as you used it, did not suit him. And you had better change it as soon as you can, or we shall be overpowered with Johnson and Blair all the rest of the way. I am sure, cried Catherine, I did not mean to say anything wrong, but it is a nice book, and why should not I call it so? Very true, said Henry, and this is a very nice day, and we are taking a very nice walk, and you are two very nice young ladies. Oh, it is a very nice word indeed. It does for everything. Originally, perhaps, it was applied only to express neatness, propriety, delicacy, or refinement. People were nice in their dress, in their sentiments, or their choice. But now every commendation on every subject is comprised in that one word. Why, in fact, cried his sister, it ought only to be applied to you, without any commendation at all. You are more nice than wise. Come, Miss Morland, let us leave him to meditate over our faults in the utmost propriety of diction while we praise Udolpho in whatever terms we like best. The fact that Eleanor, by far the wisest woman in the novel, has the last word here seems to indicate that she is voicing Jane Austen's opinion on the matter, though, as we have seen earlier, Austen tended to have rather conservative views on language. This is just one more intriguing contradiction in Northanger Abbey that I do not ambition to solve today, though. Okay, so now let's talk about Anne Ratcliffe, Jane Austen and two of their novels. So first, why did I choose Anne Ratcliffe for my comparison? Well, because she was the superstar of the literary scene at the time. She was nicknamed the Great Enchantress, and Jane Austen herself was a big fan and definitely referenced her work in at least one of her own novels, that is, Northanger Abbey. Anne Ratcliffe was a major writer of the Gothic novel, and her novels probably had as much influence in forming gender representations in young girls growing up at that time as the series Charmed had on me, for example. Jane Austen, on the other hand, created her own new genre, domestic realism, which is not quite like the sentimental novel. She made extensive use of humour, irony and satire, and her realism came from a keen observation of the world she lived in, though her description was somehow over-realistic in that most of her characters are stereotypes, that is, that she essentialized them to one specific trait people would recognize because they encountered it in their everyday life. What struck me when I researched those two authors is how they can similarly be considered either conservative or progressive, depending on how you look at their work. For instance, one can see The Mistress of Idolfo as a very long conduct book, in that the basic structure is that of a fable or a tale, where Emily's father teaches her good morals and then she triumphs by keeping to these teachings, which is a rather conservative, patriarchal kind of story. Alternately, Emily's aunts, and then Emily's own resistance to Montoni, their refusal to sign off their property to him, as well as Emily's refusal of Valancourt as long as he doesn't prove he can be a good husband to her, make the novel an advocacy for more female agency, which was a rather progressive idea at the time. Similarly, Jane Austen's work paints society as a divine creation in which everybody has a role to play and the gentry fulfills the role abandoned by the aristocracy. However, her work is definitely very critical of the patriarchy, of how women are bound to resort to mercenary tactics for maintenance and survival. She also advocates for a kind of new type of marriage, 
Instead of choosing either love or money, she advocates for a form of marriage based on both sense and sensibility, one in which both affection and respect can be found. Nevertheless, most of her heroines end up marrying way higher than their station, which is not very realistic, though it was probably a way for her to give her fictional characters the happy ending women in the real world deserve but cannot have. In a way, she creates fantasies of perfect couples that her readers can fantasize about, and that may help them bear the boredom of their own situation, just like Anne Ratcliffe's great adventures provide a momentary escape from their golden prison. So the first question I tried to answer in my dissertation was, how much do women and men talk in those novels and why? Also, what does it tell us about the story, the context or the authors? In The Mistress of Udolfo, around three quarters of the book are told by the narrator, and almost the same amount of words is spoken by women and by men, though women tend to utter many more words in average than men because most main characters are women and there are also many more un unimportant male characters than female characters with spoken lines. In Pride and Prejudice, only a little more than half of the novel is actually told by the narrator. The characters' dialogues and letters make up for almost half of the novel, and among them women speak twice as much as men, which can be explained by the fact that there are more women than men with lines. However, in comparison with The Mistress of Adolfo, men and women are given a somewhat more equal share of the dialogues, though women are still given more overall. So overall, in both novels, women's words are given more space than men's, so it sounds like both novels are designed as platforms for voicing women's opinions. However, upon more minute examination, it appears that they were designed in very different ways to serve very different aims. In The Mistress of Udolfo, dialogues are very often narrative. A character explains what happened elsewhere instead of the narrator. That means that most of the novel relates narration, action, plot, and the characters are mostly doers. They do things. In Pride and Prejudice, most of the dialogues voice opinions, not stories. The narration is mostly assumed by the narrator, whereas the ideas, the moral debates, are voiced by the characters themselves. Very little happens in terms of action. The characters are mostly speakers. In fact, The Mistress of Udolfo is a Bildungsroman, or Roman d'apprentissage, a coming-of-age story. The story is about completing Emily's education as she reaches adulthood. In the first part of the novel, Emily therefore speaks very little and listens to her father's last teachings before he dies. In the rest of the novel, she is then supposed to put her father's words into action. Emily is therefore, before all, a listener and a doer, which explains why she speaks less than twice as little as Lizzie in her own novel. Lizzie, on the other hand, is a speaker. She also gains knowledge and wisdom in the journey, but instead of being a passive student, it is by confronting her opinions with the real world that she grows. Speech is actually her mode of action, and she and Darcy both grow from this mutual education through almost constant verbal disputes. Now, because characters are not always present, and most likely only speak lines that are useful to the plot, we can't use the numbers I've presented to determine who's talkative and who's not in the novels. However, talkativeness is discussed several times in The Mistress of Udolfo. There are two characters who are presented through Emily's point of view as chatterboxes. Both are women, but more importantly, both are servants. They are Theresa and Annette. As they are both grieving for Emily's father's death, Theresa is described as someone who doesn't know when to stop talking and therefore talks too much, in comparison with Emily who grieves in silence. But what constitutes too much? Well, studies have shown that too much talk is not an objective measure, duh. Too much usually means more than what the people in power talk. That's why when women talk more than men, they are considered talkative, but this also applies like here to servants, for instance. Same goes for Annette, Emily's aunt's servant, who ends up doing all of Emily's errands in the castle of Udolfo, which is full of banditti. 
Annette is genuinely scared to go about the castle alone, especially since she's ultra superstitious. And she also tells Emily all the news, which is definitely useful talk. Yet, Emily scolds her repeatedly for talking too much and not to great effect. Disregarding Annette's emotion and probable need for human connection. The same happens to Carlo, the vile Montoni's steward at Udolfo. While talking about the necessary repairs to the castle, he goes off topic several times as he also talks about his departed wife and each time Montoni interrupts him to tell him to focus on what they are talking about. Carlo's talk here may be irrelevant to the topic of repairs, but it is relevant, at least for him, in the context of seeing his master again after two years of absence, or even just seeing people again, as he has been living alone for some time now. This talk has a social function, that of connection. He is giving news and might expect some solicitude at the loss of his wife, but Montoni, focusing on the hierarchical aspects of their relationship only, deems it irrelevant and wearisome. Thus, overall, very little space, if not no space at all, is given to words spoken by and regarding people who are considered inferior. A somewhat similar situation, though actually quite different, can be found in Pride and Prejudice at Lady Catherine's. Of course, it's not because she speaks too much per se that Elizabeth receives the harsh remark. It is because she gives her opinion and is not expected to due to her age, as Lady Catherine explains, but also to her inferior status. In all the conversations Lady Catherine takes part in, she has the lead and the other characters only listen to her, gratefully accept her advice and agree to do as she bids. Therefore, they only speak a small amount. In this scene, Elizabeth departs from this established protocol and giving her opinion necessarily amounts to speaking more than is expected. Her speech is therefore deemed excessive when compared to the benchmark established by custom for such a conversation at Rosings Park. So are women more emotional? Well, in order to answer this question, I looked for markers of emphatic prosody, such as exclamation marks, um, quotation verbs such as cried or exclaimed, as well as words in italics. Now, the results are final. In both novels, women definitely speak with a more emotional voice than men, though the difference is a bit smaller in Pride and Prejudice. Two remarks, though. One. If you compare Jane and Bingley's prosody, they actually have very similar scores. However, that makes Bingley an emotional speaker by men's standards, whereas that makes Jane a very calm speaker by women's standards. And this is actually exactly how they are perceived and described by other characters. Bingley is scolded by Darcy for boasting of his rashness. Jane, on the other side, is definitely the most composed of the Bennet sisters. This proves that there were already different expectations for men and women in terms of behaviour at that time. However, I find the fact that they are very similar super cute. And two, in both novels there is one exception to the men speak in a more composed voice rule. It's Valancourt and Bingley, who both have a much higher score than men, and Valancourt even has a much higher score than women. At first, I didn't quite know what to do with this piece of information I found, but a member of my defence committee remarked that I had just characterised the speech of a specific type of character, Prince Charming, which is a little paradoxical given that both characters are kind of scolded for their emotion and impulsivity, but they do end up with an heroine, so they must deserve them. I can't yet figure out whether more emotion in a man is considered a good thing or not, Yet another contradiction that makes those works so interesting, in my opinion. So thank you very much for watching this video, which has very much come to an end, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested, there's plenty much more information where all of this came from, and although I never took the time of making the corrections I should have to my dissertation, I would be more than happy to share it with you if you just ask. Otherwise, you can find me on Instagram, and if you're in France, I just gave a conference a few weeks ago at the Bordeaux Geek Fest, and I'm very much planning on doing the same next year, so just come and let's meet there. <laughs>